Welcome to the Archimedes stage, the home of network security and free software. So up next we have Jennifer Perry. She's an internet safety expert and consumer advocate. And she'll be talking about how anyone can harvest data on you and data stalking tools available now. So put your hands together for Jennifer Perry. Hi. Thank you so much for coming. It's the third day into the campus party. It's early morning. I wasn't sure anyone was going to show up. So I'm grateful that you're here today. I say, I deal with digital stalking. I deal with how abusers use technology against victims. That's why I want to talk to you today, particularly about surveillance and the surveillance technology that's available for anybody. It's cheap, it's cheerful, and it's easy to access. There's been a lot of controversy about spying, and people are often quite concerned about the government. Who's spying on you? Personally, I'm not very worried about the government, because A, I'm fairly boring, and B, I pay my taxes. But more importantly, I've seen enough government technology projects that go way over budget and are delayed so long, by the time they come to the market, they're out of date. So I'm not particularly worried about government. But who else spies on you? Technology companies. The Facebooks, the Googles, the advertising networks. Am I worried about them spying on me? Absolutely. They know more about me than any member of my family possibly knows about me. But I think that's kind of another talk, a very long talk for another day. The thing about the government and technology companies, at least I understand their motivations for spying on me what they want, what they hope to gain. Now, being targeted by another problem is what I'm most worried about and what I think most people should be worried about. And that is people. People targeting you, people that you don't know. Today, when you meet someone, you know, people you've met in, at, uh, at this event, I'm sure you're looking up who they are, looking up at social networks, doing research on them, just to see who they are. Nothing sinister, and we all do it nowadays. Acquaintances offline, acquaintances online. Somebody makes a comment, and you think, well, who are they? You have a look. If you're not checking out your prospective girlfriends and boyfriends, you should, because everybody else is doing that. University, employers, business partners, they're, they're all going to look to see what's available about you online. And I'm not really worried about that level because they're not going very deep. They're having a cursory view to get an overview of who you are. And after all, we put profiles up there, especially on places like LinkedIn, where we want to show people who we are in, in our experiences. Now, I'm concerned about stalkers, people that fixate on you, people that are obsessed with you. This is a whole different level of interest. This is a person that will spend literally hours every day monitoring you, researching you, trying to intimidate, harass, or destroy you, or in some cases, rape or murder you. Those are the people that I think you should be worried about. About 60% of stalkers are ex-partners. Um, and it doesn't take very long. Claire Brunel was um, murdered by a boyfriend. That relationship lasted only three weeks. Within three weeks, she realized there was something not right with this guy. She ended it. And he started harassing her. She told him to stop. And his response was to go get firearm training and a gun and murder her inside Harvey Nicks. That was a three-week relationship. It doesn't take long for obsessive types to latch on to their targets. 20% is work-related. Your colleagues spying on you. Um, or people that you work with, customers and clients. And there's certain occupations that make you at a higher risk. If you're a lawyer, if you're a police officer, if you work within the medical community, you're at a much higher risk of being stalked by the people that you work with. And one sad statistic is about 5% are family members that stalk you. Family fallouts are common, divorce is common. You end up with family members being angry and stalking someone else. 
And then there's a section of stalkers that I think the technical term I'll call it is the nutters. The complete strangers that will start stalking. I had a male client who was a daily commuter on a train. He sat down somewhere, decided he was going to change seats, and the person who was sitting beside him decided that he was changing seats because of him, and he got offended, and he started stalking someone. Okay. If that's the simple trigger, and we see triggers on social networks all the time, people that will say something and offend someone, and they start this a digital abuse and this a digital attack, then you have to think, well, how can I prevent that? And the answer is, when you're dealing with delusional and nutter people, you can't, but you need to be aware. Some other examples. Um, people often think that a, a real-life stalker is worse than a uh, cyber stalker. Not true, because when you're cyber stalked, everybody is your stalker. If you don't know who your stalker is, you suspect everybody. You suspect your friends, you suspect your family, you suspect your colleagues, and you suspect every stranger that you meet. We had a victim who was being stalked. Her stalker knew where she worked, how she got there, her pattern, and repeatedly threatened to push her in front of a train. So every day she goes down onto the tube not knowing who her stalker is and wondering is it the person behind her, next to her. She became so frightened that she had to leave her job. She could no longer take public transport to get to work. Male victims of stalking are different than female victims. Female victims are often uh, the focus physical. Physical assault, physical rape, physical intimidation. Male stalking victims tend to get their lives ruined from financial reputation. And that tends to be the focus of male, male stalking victims. So we had, this is a common practice, a very common practice, a revenge stalker. Person gets mad at a, a male, he's a consultant, and that person goes around to each of his clients and says, you will stop using him or I will ruin your reputation online. I will make sure you feel unsafe. And he loses all his clients, he loses all his business, and he becomes bankrupt. One of the things that we, we have with when I'm working with the police is the police thinks, well, if it's happening online, it's not really a physical threat. One of the big problems that we have is it's not so hard to hack into people's account. Hack. It's guessing their password and accessing it, really, isn't it? We had a, a, a woman who was in a domestic violence. She fleed and got into a safe house. He knew her eBay account. He knew her password. He was very patient because he waited for her to buy something and then contacted the supplier and said, you know, that item never arrived. Could you tell me where you had it sent? Found her new safe home, went around, beat her, hospitalized, and she was left permanently blinded in her left eye. How many people would associate an access on an account to such a violent physical threat? Not many, and certainly often when you're dealing with police officers, they don't think about it. One of the conversations I was having, I would do training and I work with uh, social workers, and one of her clients was very confused. She had gone to a tea room to just have a meeting with a girlfriend, came back, and her partner re played a recording of their conversation. And she didn't know how he did it. Was he bugging the tea room? Was it her friend? He was bugging the conversation. Was there a private eye? No, he was a partner. He had access to a mobile phone. He was using spyware. And when I was having this conversation and the social worker realized what had happened, she just went white and she said, my God, she was in the room yesterday and we're discussing her escape plan. What if he was listening at that point? What do we do? Sexual predators um, love the internet. And they can be pedophiles, they can be other types of sexual predator. I had one um, sexual predator that was going into a history chat room 
right? This isn't an adult chat room. This isn't online dating. This is a local history chat room talking about local history of a town. And uh, this guy would basically chat and pick up married women. And then he would get them in compromising positions. And then he would inform the husbands. And he was a predator then. He, that's how he got his kicks. He was a sadistic predator in that sense. One of the most common ones we see is ex-partner gets mad at his girlfriend, goes on to uh, adult chat sites, pretending to be her, offering sex, sending men to her house. And then it escalates. Now he's going to go on there and he's going to say he has a rape fantasy and give explicit directions on how he would like to be raped, pretending to be her, and sending men to the house in order to rape her. It's very common. These are all incredibly common tactics. So if you're a victim of that type of stalking, you can understand how it's not an inconvenience, it's not hurtful comments. This type of behavior goes way beyond that. And they are scary, scary people. Stalkers, trolls, abusers, they have a lot of the same personality traits. They tend to be narcissistic. They tend to be entitled, often controlling issues, obsessive, very manipulative. Remember what I said about calling the eBay supplier? They'll do very manipulative things to get information to use uh, uh, to abuse the victim. And they're deceitful. And let me tell you, these are not the world's winners. They are usually not the people that are very successful. They do not have a good social life. They don't have a lot of friends themselves. And they view themselves as victims. The stalkers think that they, because remember they're entitled and narcissistic, they think, my God, I should be doing so much better in the world. You know, it's woe me, right? All these things have happened to me, and it's always somebody else. They blame somebody else. It's never their fault. And they have a problem distinguishing fantasy from reality. You know the type of person that kind of believes their own lies, believes their own puff? We all know them. That type of fantasy, that type of delusion is something that we constantly see in stalkers. So if you kind of recognize any of these traits amongst friends or those work colleagues that are, are, match the 20%, you should think twice about your relationship or getting too close to them. But how likely are you to be stalked? One in five women will be stalked during their lifetime. One in 10 men, oops, I got carried away there. One in 10 men. And the numbers are increasing. And why are they increasing? They're increasing due to technology. There's lots and lots of studies. We can drag them out. But we know that if you stay connected with an ex-partner, right, by a social network or whatever, and you can see what they're doing, feelings of jealousy are more pronounced. You're less likely to start dating again. It takes you longer to get over the relationship. And you're more likely to abuse substances by just staying connected with an ex-partner onto Facebook or a social network. You know when you get pissed off at someone, really angry at someone, and you're fuming for a few days. If you don't see them or you can't contact them, those feelings subside. But if you have access to a social network where you can take your revenge and start posting hateful messages or threatening messages, then you may take that opportunity, especially if you've been drinking or, or going over and over the problem. So the fact that that technology is there, that you can access people 24 hours a day, seven days a week, means that people are able to fester these feelings, whether they're, they're feelings of, of rejection, feelings of revenge, feelings of anger. And because we have the access to that, it's increasing, and it's increasing these type of antisocial relationship issues on the internet and social networks and, and mobile phone apps, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What is so shocking, and when I when I talk to the police or I go 
talk to, to victims and they, they don't recognize the technology or what technology is being used against them. What's so shocking is how easy the technology is available and how absolutely powerful it is. Don't worry about the government. The technology that's out there is, um, for the consumer is as powerful as, as most abusers need. It's off the shelf. It means it's ready to go, right? It's been idiot-proofed. You don't even have to be interested in technology to use some of this stuff. It's easy to find. Type in, cheat on my wife, tap a wire phone, pick a lock. And if you don't find it on WikiHow, you're going to find it on YouTube, right? A lot of people are willing to share a lot of information on how to be abusive and intrusive into people's lives. And it's cheap. It is so, so cheap. And if you're obsessive about somebody, you're willing to spend some money on them, let me tell you. I love this, uh, this advert. It's a real advert. It's from MSpy. It's mobile spy software. It epitomizes the type of technology that's out there. But the guy's really creepy, and it kind of also epitomizes the type of people that are using the technology. A business associate of mine had used MSpy to learn that his wife was having an affair. By using MSpy, he was able to catch her red-handed, which saved him thousands of dollars in legal fees and court costs. As a business owner, I work a lot of late nights, and there are times when I'm traveling for weeks on business. I started to fear that it was costing me my marriage. I feared that my wife was having an affair. I confronted her. She denied it. She even said that I could hire a private detective if I didn't believe her. Private detectives can cost a fortune. So once again, I turned to MSpy, which only costs $18 a month, to monitor her calls, her texts, and her private conversations. After a few months, I realized that I was just being paranoid, that she was really innocent of any infidelity. But that's not the end of the story. No, it isn't. A few weeks later, I couldn't get a hold of her on her cell phone, so I logged on to MSpy and was able to learn that she was stopped in this old country road far from the city. I called the local police immediately and gave them her exact geographic location. They arrived and they informed me that she'd had a terrible car accident, and that if they hadn't gotten there when they did, she might have died from her injuries. So how are things now after just a few months of using MSpy? Well, I'm Happy to say that my family is safe and healthy and happy, and that my business is more profitable than ever. All thanks to MSpy. Thanks for your stories, Brad. Thank you. Whether it's for business, personal, or just simple curiosity, you can see that MSpy has a variety of uses. You can use it how you want, when you want, to monitor whomever you want to view text messages, call logs, GPS tracking, memos, tasks and calendars, emails, contact lists, events, videos and photos, and remotely listen to personal conver conversations. Imagine if you're obsessive, like this controlling individual. I mean, we could t I could talk a whole bunch about him just alone, really. Um, imagine if you're obsessive, how exciting this type of technology is for you. Because when you're being stalked, when you're an obsessive person, it's like a gambling addiction, right? So when a gambler makes a win, it feeds that addiction. It gives them that adrenaline high. When a stalker finds out new information, when they are able to analyze a new photo, it gives them that same sense of euphoria. And so this type of technology is really important to them and they will use it and they use it on a constant basis. If I have a victim, I assume their mobile phone's been tampered with. I assume they've got spyware on their computers and I also assume they've got listening devices in their homes now. So if you're being stalked, if you want to stalk someone, this is not how to stalk, this isn't the whole thing. But there's a lot of things that are available. The first thing is the social networks, the one-stop stalking shop. Facebook is the best one-stop stalking shop on the planet because it gives you such a long history. It gives you the photos. You can, you can really start to understand who a person is by just going back through their history on their, 
their Facebook. You can see the whole list of their friends and their family and what they like and what they don't like. So it gives you basically the whole basis of an individual. Then there's even more scary things, which is the electoral register, right? So the electoral register is sold to marketing companies and made available to anyone on the internet. For a couple of pounds, I can find out where you live, your phone number, when you bought your house, who your neighbors are, and then what do, am I going to do? I'm going to put it into Google Maps. I'm going to see exactly where you live and where's the best place to watch you from so you don't see me. Things like um, company directories. Universities often publish lists of people in the department in their emails. Photos, photos with meta tags, fantastic. I'm a predator on the internet. I'm chatting with you in an adult chat room and I say, send me a picture. You do a selfie with a mobile, send it to them. They know now your exact location, right? So all this technology that's being put on by default that we use are, are, are when you're at risk, it's a big risk. When you're not at risk, it's not an issue. But once you get one of those ex-partners or work colleagues or that really strange your danger nutter, you've got a problem. And geolocation apps are burying more and more geolocation information. Even if you turn off your GPS system, they're triangling, triangling the mobile phone mass and the Wi-Fi, so they don't need your GPS location anymore. Surveillance. So the first state is research. And, and, and predators will spend hours and hours and hours a day researching. We had a, a victim named Claire, and her stalker Googled her 40,000 times in a year. That's the level of obsession we're talking about. So once they get the research and they know who you are, and they will also start to then stalk and monitor everybody around you, by the way, they will try to access your online accounts. Right? If you can get into an iTunes account or Android account, you can see where that person is. Thanks to the Find My Phone app, you can turn on the microphone, you can lock the phone, you can wipe the phone, you can get every contact details and access all the data that they're storing and backing up in the cloud. They could also download apps, run up phone bills, all of that by accessing your account. So you may not even have to spend that $18 a month if you can just access their online account. Spyware. So not only is there mobile spyware, there's computer spyware, which is even better because all you have to do is send an email to put it onto a computer. And then you can do everything uh, any type of remote assistance software can do, including turning on the webcam and watching that individual and listening to the conversations in a room. So if you think about the type of personality that we're talking about, are they going to spend that money to do that? Can they manipulate you to open up that picture? Of course they can. Dear Jane, I'm going to put these pictures on you porn. What she can do, she's absolutely going to open up those pictures to see what, what he's threatening to do. Listening devices. Listening devices used to cost a lot more. You have to get through private investigators. Now you can go onto a website and buy an electrical cord. It looks like a standard electrical cord. has a SIM in it. You call it. It turns on the device so that you can listen to what's happening in the room. 65 pounds. Available on Amazon.co.uk. Really scary stuff. GPS trackers. We regularly see GPS trackers. In the US this year, they're going to be launching something called the Tile. Great little product. Right? Put it on your key fob, stick it on the granny who has Alzheimer's, on the cat, anything. You can use a mobile app and see where it's at. Right? $20, right? It's great technology. A lot of this technology is not designed for abusers. It's just misused by abusers. But for $20, you can stick that into somebody's backpack, somebody's phone, into the backseat of their car. And then you've got the cheapest tracking device on the market. Outdoor motion cameras. Now you just stick them on a pole, a battery, upload it, go back five days later, get the videos, change the batteries out, and you're good to go again. And I see this type of 
surveillance technology being used all the time. This isn't the exception to the rule. A lot of this is the rule that I assume is happening to victims. And it's cheap. It is so cheap. Mobile spyware, 40 pounds for three months. Find my phone app, free of charge. Computer spyware, 40, 40 pounds. Spoof SMS texts. So this is where you go onto a service and you can send a text and make it appear it's coming from any phone number. One thing that stalkers love to do, or trolls or harassers, they like to be the victim. So they'll send themselves text looking like it's coming from the victim in order to incriminate the victim and then report the victim to the police. One of the most common things we have is stalkers reporting victims and claiming to be the victim. I mean, reporting victims claiming to be the victim, but they're the perpetrator. Like I said, the extension cord, lock picking set. 15 uh, pounds. I went to the police, I said, oh gosh, you know, buying a lock picking set doesn't mean that you can actually pick a lock. They looked at me and they said, two to three hours is all you take to learn how to pick a lock. And we have an amazing amount of victims that'll say, I think he's broken into my home, and, but he hasn't moved anything. And I kept thinking, well, how do they keep breaking into the home? And then you think, oh, you know, you can buy a lock picking set. Again, Amazon. $15. Listening through the wall device. So you get a window, you point the microphone, and you can listen to the conversations inside the home. Right? So not only good for stalkers, but you know, corporate espionage would be up there as well. And I said it's outdoor video. All this stuff, less than 200 pounds. So what's coming next? All this, because all technology, as it becomes available in the corporate, tends to get um, consumerized. I, geolocation is becoming more and more and more pervasive. It's being embedded. It's being embedded in, in lots of different ways, and that data is being stored. And we really don't know the long or short-term views of different companies and policies of what they're going to do with that data. Facial recognition, Facebook's announcement last week where they're going to be using your profile as an identifier. You know, believe me, within a few years, you're going to be able to stick a picture on there and say, find me any pictures of this person on the internet. And then the question is, is it going to leak over into CCTV and internet? Where is it going to go? And social networks are exposing more and more data and making it widely available. Now this isn't consumers doing something wrong, it's technology companies exposing more and more of our data. In 2005, when you signed up for Facebook, the blue area is what was public. The white area was what was private, okay? By 2010, the blue area is what is public the white area is what is private. People aren't sharing more information. Data and technology companies are exposing more information and moving the goalposts for people. And when they do that, they sit there and I love every time Facebook says why it's so wonderful, they're changing the public policy, privacy policy, and how it's going to be a great benefit. And what they never do is say what the risks are. Right? And the problem is, we don't think like abusers, we don't think like stalkers. So when we see a new piece of technology, and they say what the benefits are, you see the benefits. But we don't stop and say, if I had a nutter following me, could they use that against me? If I had an ex-boyfriend that became really nasty, or an ex-girlfriend, what am I using that they can use against me? Those aren't the questions we aren't asking, and we're not encouraged to ask those questions now. So if you're looking at this graph, and this was done, I should have the source, I apologize. This was done by a proper research group. It wasn't done by me. But by 2013, basically, I would say 100% is available by default. And now, there are things that you used to be able to keep private, absolutely private, that Facebook absolutely won't let you keep private. And it's not just Facebook. It'll be other social networks and other applications. There's a conflict of interest. They make money out of data, 
right? And we allow them to do that, right? But it means that there is a conflict between user safety and profits. And so far, profits have always won out. The Facebook graph is the other big up and coming thing that they did that really frightened the crap out of me, to be honest. So this is a screenshot where I did a search on show me everybody in the UK that, be, that liked the national stalking helpline pages. Who likes stalking helpline pages? Stalking victim. Who likes domestic violence pages? Domestic violence victims. Who likes Gamblers Anonymous pages that want, or support pages, or addiction support, or anorexic support pages? Anorexics, right? So now you can go in there and say, show me this vulnerable group. And Facebook says, oh, I'll show you. And I'll give you their profile and their likes. You can add them as a friend. You can message them or you can follow them. It is the predator's dream come true. You can narrow it down by age, you can narrow it down where they live. I can go there and say, show me all widowers living in Oxford under the age of 54, because I fancy a sugar daddy, right? And now you have mobile apps that take the Facebook graph that will sit there and shortlist cute girls or cute boys in your area with their profile, so you can go up to them and what did somebody say? Oh, it's an icebreaker. Oh, you went to such and such school. I knew somebody that went there. These are absolutely stalker, financial predators, dreams come true, and they're being used, absolutely being used on a daily basis. So there are lots of benefits to technology, I use technology, I'm not gonna give up technology, and I don't think that's the answer. And really, a lot of the things I talk about are not, we're not at risk until somebody's using it. It may be the stalker, it may be the health insurance company that pulls up your information and refuses to pay out, right? But until you're at risk, until you're being targeted, until that data or information's being used against you, it's fine. But the problem is we're not digital virgins anymore. And once we are getting in a position of risk, it's a big risk and it's difficult to mop up. And it's, part of it is because we don't recognize what those risks are. So we have to start not only talking about the benefits, we've got to start having a conversation and thinking, do I want to use this app so much and what's the downside of it, you know? What's the positive and negative? You know, take a few minutes. And whatever you're doing on the internet, you've got to remember, you know, they say, people say, remember the children. I say, remember the nutters. Remember the people out there that are, you know, of dubious character, have personality disorders. They are out there on the internet trolling and looking for their next victim. Thank you. So I'm open for a Q&A, so if there's any questions or anything. We've got Mike up here. Yep, if anyone's got any questions, do you want to just pop your hands in the air? Any questions at all? No? Yeah. Oh, one. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, um, first of all, I'd like to say that it's incredibly easy to report uh, cybercrime in the UK. Um, I go to the online site and uh, fill in the form. I was talking with an officer within five minutes, so that's one thing. Really? Yes. Well, that's not the, that's not the rule, I have to say. Okay, and as regards uh, things like um, the rape fantasy scam, um, have we got any statistics that, uh, as regards convictions? that uh, back up the numbers? Well, first of all, we don't have numbers mm -hmm. because the abuse is reported to technology companies and technology companies don't give us their abuse numbers. So that's one of the big difficulties. And a lot of stalking and things, the victims actually don't know where this originated from. They don't know that there's been an advert put in an adult chat room and somebody's been sent to their rooms. 
So, no, we don't have numbers about this guy put an advert in and this was the reaction. Okay, because the next question I was going to say is, obviously, the, I was going to ask you what resources the police should direct. And they need kind of statistics because there are real women getting attacked in real situations. Uh -huh. So every time you divert resources from one thing, um, it well, diminishes We, we from have another. certain statistics. We know that 2.5 2 women are murdered every week in the UK. And the majority of those would have stalking. We have statistics about honor-based violence, honor-based crimes. Most of those will have been stalked. Uh -huh. Pedophiles are a stalker. That's a stalker group. We have statistics about pedophiles. We also have the National Crime Survey. It says 120,000 people are stalked each year. So we have the numbers. The, um, the problem is that numbers are sometimes banded around. Like when you said the rape fantasy thing, uh, scam is very common. That's mm -hmm. the kind of thing the media would pick up and, and overemphasize sometimes. The media's going to overemphasize anything that's uh -huh. a hot topic, whether there's statistics there or there or not, let's be honest. You know, I'm telling you common tactics that we see that are reported to us when we're dealing with women in domestic violence in hostile shelters and refuges, and, and we don't keep those statistics. And the difficulty is most of those statistics are lying within the technology abuse teams, and we don't have access to those. Yeah, and the, the, but the main thing is never just sit back and not report something. No, and, but, but reporting is very difficult. Um, we're still getting less than 0.01% convictions on stalking in the UK, even with the new you know, um, legislation. There's been a six month review. Um, and especially when it comes to digital stalking, because it's very difficult to get the evidence through third parties, especially Twitters and Facebook, which are based in the, in, in the US. So um, most of my advice to victims is, yes, report it. But if you've got an obsessive compulsive personality, getting the police to do a restraining order isn't going to help you, uh -huh. right? It is much more about what victims need to do to secure themselves personally and online. You're more, you will have more of an effect on an obsessive personality than a police officer will. And do we need any new laws? Like in the UK, it's already illegal to carry a lockpicking kit, kit on you. I don't think we need any new laws. The problem is, it isn't the laws, it's the enforcement okay. and, and justice system. Um, thank you for um, the insights. I, I think... Um, you gave one uh, one statement which might give some type of solution where one could hold the technology companies accountable. You said that um, you know obsessive people will probably Google someone forty thousand times. So mm. so there are ways potentially with technology to, to based on the insights that you gather because you work with victims to mm -hmm. actually take those patterns and use the technology against the um, the predators. Right. The question is though. Which, which I'm asking, it, um, do you see that the technology companies have, have, this, uh, ha have the incentives to do that? Because you also said it's actually always profit versus safety. It is. Yeah? Uh, technology companies don't like dealing with abuse because abuse is a cost center that's not generating revenue. Um, and we know they could do a lot more. They always claim ignorance. But we know, for example, if you're on Twitter and you get a phishing, uh, you get a, a spam attack, they're on that very quickly. That's like technology identifying spammers and malware and viruses. They can use that same technology to identify predators and serial abusers and trawlers. Right? So the technology is there. It's, it's the willingness. And they're also they're afraid that once they start doing um, some more preventative stuff, they get people waiting in on freedom of speech. I, I, I have freedom of speech to be able to troll and harass you is a common issue. Um, and also, if they prove that they can deal with some areas of abuse, there'll be more pressure on them to deal with other areas of abuse, and that costs them money, and they don't want to do that. Do we have any more questions? Anyone here? Yeah. 
Hi. Uh, Hi. Maybe you covered this, but I wondered what you think. Um, in the UK, uh, some of these international providers uh, don't cooperate aren't so keen to cooperate with the UK police. I think there's more appetite for cooperation between UK technology providers than there is between, and the UK police, than there is between the international providers and the UK police. Uh, absolutely, I mean there was a statistic about how many police requests there were for Facebook broken down by countries and I think it was two and a half thousand for the UK and I'm thinking, is that all? Really? Only two and a half thousand requests for information? And Facebook doesn't always comply. It depends on whether they think it's a crime that they're willing to support, um, like grooming they'll support, but harassment, they often don't give the information. I had a conversation with the Home Office um, recently, and they want to bring in new legislation so that they can retain, and there's a difference between retain and access, they want to retain people's logs on where they go clicking through on the internet, just like Google does for you, just like Facebook does, just like every other website does. They want to retain that information and then based on the judicial system and warrants, they can access it. One of the main reasons to do that is because they're losing so many cases against trying to bring perpetrators to justice due to lack of cooperation from uh, these websites are either based in the US or based in Latvia or Brazil or whatever. They can't get the data to, to either further investigations or to bring prosecutions. So they're looking at ways of how can we get data within the UK and that is through the ISPs retaining more data and then requesting that through the judicial system during an investigation. Um, there has been a, a big discussion um, the last days around digital confidence. Mm -hmm. um, how confident are you that in the era where all governments try to open data to help the economy, mm -hmm. that, that things will get better or not? Well, I think the problem is, is that they make an agreement on one thing and then technology moves it forward. The electoral role was originally available to marketers for direct mail and faxing purposes. At that time, they had no indication that it was going to be made available to everyone via, via internet. Internet wasn't going at the time. So what happens is, what data or whatever they're, they're making it allowed for one specific purpose, but as technology moves on, it gets used and leaked out for other purposes. And that's where we're seeing multiple risks. So, is the answer potentially that you need within the government a, a body that just nothing else but just trying to keep up with the changes and change the terms and conditions for using those data in the same way Facebook and the Googles of the world do? Well, I would like to see um, government and police to have independent technologists. I've been in a meeting where we were discussing privacy settings and security settings and a social network misrepresented what the users could do. Now, I think that's probably because the person didn't use that particular website enough and I knew it better, right? And I said, that's not how it works and I was told to be quiet, okay? So, when I deal with Westminster or the Home Office or police, they are much happier to take the word of big business and a lobbyist and a lawyer and they find charities and independent people like me as a big pain in the ass, right? But what they need is somebody to sit beside those departments that are independently technology. They can verify what these technology and lobbyists are telling them. But right now, they just believe them. You know, and we're too trusting. We're too trusting at government level. So they need to have an independent, you know, not charity-based, not any, they need an independent technologies to help them identify what is true and or to be able to test what they're being told. And that's currently not happening. 
Any more questions then before we finish up? No. Thank you, Jennifer, for your insightful talk. A round of applause for Jennifer Perry. And at 11, we'll have Matthew Gretton-Dan on ARM 64-bit architecture. Thank you.